Hello, my name is Mark Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this second annual Collective Perspectives. This week's discussion is part of our ongoing effort to share the story of our exceptional collection of 18th century Newport furniture. Our Collective Perspectives programming this year is made possible by a very generous gift from an anonymous donor. In truth, the donations from countless individuals and organizations interested in the material culture and history of the 18th century are what allow us to continue our ongoing work at Whitehorn House. So if you're enjoying this program, I ask that you consider making a donation to the Newport Restoration Foundation. You can visit the NRF website, newportrestoration.org, and click on the word support. A gift in any amount is genuinely appreciated. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Newport Restoration Foundation's second annual Collective Perspectives, um, a series of discussions about topics related to the work and collections of the Whitehorn House Museum. This year, we've been attempting to understand America's cyclical fascination with the material culture and personalities of 18th century British America. In other words, what is the significance of and why do Americans continually return to colonial revivals? Um, I'm Eric Greenberg, Director of Museums for NRF. It's my great pleasure to host and moderate these sessions. So um, let's begin our program in earnest. Uh, today, we've been exploring the way in which the image of British colonial America and its material culture have played out in American consumer history and through the work of furniture makers past and present. Tonight, we try to understand other revivals uh, as they have played out in the fields of the decorative arts, architecture, and other forms of cultural production. In truth, I'm not sure I would have seen this as a, as a natural uh, program for us to do um, this month were it not for conversations I had with scholars uh, throughout the country who directed me to some of the wonderful people um, who are with us tonight, these really brilliant and creative colleagues. So please let me introduce them to you. Lydia Matisse Brandt is an architectural historian at the University of South Carolina, whose work explores the fascinating intersection of architectural history, historic preservation, and popular culture. She holds a BA in history from New York University and an MA in and PhD in architectural history from the University of Virginia. <clears throat> Dr. Brandt's uh, various scholarly interests seem to all come together in her 2016 work, first in the homes of his countrymen, uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon in the American imagination. A wide ranging work that explores among other things, the ways in which Washington's famed residence has served as a national symbol, model home for a variety of consumers or builders, both public and private, and of course, as an interpretive center for understanding our colonial and early federal past. Dr. Brandt has a publication record that expands well beyond her recent monograph, including a vast collection of scholarly articles, book reviews, and nominations for the inclusion of various structures on the National Registry of Historical Places. She's been the recipient of numerous academic, academic honors and fellowships, including fellowships at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, one of the most beautiful museums I have ever been to in my life, um, the Winterton Museum Library and Garden, and the Fred W. Smith uh, National Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, it's, I'm so happy you're here. Um, Elizabeth Humphrey is uh, the former curatorial assistant and manager of student programs at Bowdoin College. And this fall, she will enter the doctoral program in art history at the University of Delaware. Uh, congratulations. She holds a BA in art history from Bowdoin and an MA from the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture. As a museum professional and scholar, Ms. Humphrey has assisted or worked on what I find to be an extraordinary number of exhibitions and public presentations. Indeed, had I not known better, Elizabeth, when I was reviewing your CV, I would have assumed that you've been working as a scholar and museum professional for decades. Um, instead, as it turns out, she's uh, been in the field for about three to five years or so. Uh, some of her projects include work on uh, the baskets of the Wabanaki people from past to present, an exhibition scheduled to premiere 
in January 2022 at Bowdoin College uh, Museum of Art, um, a piece called Reframing the Collection, New Considerations in uh, European and American Art, 1745 to 1875, a piece that she co-curated at Bowdoin, and uh, her exhibition planning and research work for Truths of the Trade, Slavery, and the Winterthur Collection, a piece that premiered at Winterthur in the summer of 2018. I was first referred to Elizabeth from academic colleagues who raved about her 2019 MA thesis, Moorish in the Midwest, the Alhambra's influence on 19th century American architecture. And having spent time discussing this project with her in preparation for tonight's event, I can see why so many people have been so complimentary of her work. Welcome, Elizabeth. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dennis Carr is the Virginia Steele Scott Chief Curator of American Art at the Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Garden in San Marino, California. He holds an MA from the Winterthur Program in Early American Culture at the University of Delaware and an MA in MPhil from Yale University in the History of Art. Prior to his tenure at the Huntington, Mr. Carr served as the Carolyn and Peter Lynch Curator of American Decorative Arts and Sculpture at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And prior to that, he was the Marsha Brady Tucker Graduate Curatorial Assistant and Curatorial Fellow at Yale University Art Gallery. Over a 20 plus year career in curatorial work, Dennis has mounted countless exhibitions of note, including um, his uh, most more recent work as venue curator for the LA Biennial Made in LA, colon, a version, um, which was a joint project between the Huntington and the Hammer Museum. Um, and um, as the project director and curator for Made in the Americas, the New World Discovers Asia for the Boston MFA, and Love and Loss, American Portrait and Mourning Min Miniatures at the Yale University Art Gallery. And let me just observe that Dennis is a person I've been trying to get into a room with for about 18 months. As I, I, when I first got here to Newport and realized the scope of the Whitehorn House collection, I started studying and going to other museums, reading articles, many of which Dennis wrote. And I said, oh, I really have to speak to Dennis Carr. And yet at the time I had moved from California to New England. And as I was looking for Dennis, he had moved from New England to California. And so our paths have crossed uh, metaphorically somewhere in Omaha, Nebraska, I guess. And um, I um, one day we'll get in a room together, Dennis. It is a pleasure though, to be in a virtual room with you tonight welcome to all of you thank you so much so let's begin um as i've said in my other um in these other sessions my definition of colonial revival has been pretty freewheeling and broad in an attempt to bring together a lot of really wonderful scholars so when each of you speaks of a revival um, what do you mean? Or to put it another way, is there a difference between, say, the mission revival and simply mission architecture uh, and accoutrement that becomes stylish for a particular historical moment? Or, you know, is there a difference between a revival and just collecting? And since I mentioned the missions, Dennis, why don't we start with you out there in, in Mission Revival Central in Southern California? Yeah, I'm happy to get started, Eric, and thank you for the introduction, and um, thank you for this opportunity to feel like virtually that I'm back in Newport, Rhode Island, a place that <laughs> I've traveled to so many times and spent so many years re researching and thinking about the 18th and 19th century there. Um, you know, most of my work in, in Boston actually focused on the Spanish uh, colonial period in the 16th through the 18th centuries, and so coming to California, I've had the opportunity to um, think about colonial past, but through a slightly different lens, which is really exciting. So I guess for me, think about a revival that implies that something um, has died away. So to kind of revivify something is to re, to you know, give a rebirth to something, and that certainly is the case for the mission revival style. Um, by the end of the 19th century, most of the 21 missions uh, in what's now Alta California, the state of California, um, were in ruins. And um, they, they, you know, sparked, even in that, you know, in that state, they sparked um, an interest uh, historically in the Spanish period in California, but it kind of reverberated in very different ways um, than, than I expected. Um, I, I'd like to actually show a few slides, if that's okay, Eric. Sure, go ahead. The audience kind of maybe a sense of some of the images that, that pop into my mind when thinking about this. Yep, and I think you should started. be good to share your screen. There you go. Yeah, I actually, I started, 
you know, my interest in this topic about a year ago is shortly after I moved to California and um, a group of mostly indigenous protesters tore down the statue of um, Junipero Serra, well, which occupied um, a park in downtown Los Angeles. And shortly after that, a similar sculpture was torn down in San Francisco. And it, it just marked for me like a, um, this moment of reckoning with the past and beginning to question some of the foundational mythologies uh, that have been taught in school. I know I have a, I have a fifth grader, and uh, I know in California every every fourth and fifth grader had to build yep. a sugar cube mission building <laughs> as part of their kind of learning about the colonial period. But that that has dramatically changed um, in recent years. And so when I was thinking about the early mission period, um, we have a few images at the Huntington with, within our collection. Uh, Christian Jorgensen, who is a Norwegian born artist, traveled throughout California and Texas painting images of the missions in both places. Um, and these are just two oil paintings in our collection. San Juan Capistrano, which was in, you know, kind of decrepit state by the end of the 19th century. And then San Gabriel Mission, which is actually, you know, maybe five minutes away from where I am in my office here at the Huntington. Um, which was the major mission um, in this part of, of California. Um, and it was only in the 1890s that a movement began to you know, restore these missions and bring them back to life. And concomitant to that was this birth of the mission revival style, it was almost exactly the same time period. And it, you know, it kicked off with a bang um, with the building of the California State um, Pavilion at the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. When, when California was searching for an identity and the identity it chose was this, this was the mission period in particular. So this, you know, gigantic building with really low slung, heavy architecture. It looks like the, the Alamo on steroids. Uh, <laughs> this impossible building and each of the wings of it is really a separate church facade that's been extended from the central part. Um, and it was, it was designed by, um, Arthur Page Brown, who is a kind of a Beaux Arts architect from New York, of all places, and he'd worked for McKim, Mead, and White, you know, designing these these monumental uh, buildings. And so he took some elements of the of different missions in California um, and created this you know gigantic structure, which no longer survives. Um, the style takes a turn in the 20th century and becomes something more of maybe a, a more generalized. Spanish colonial revival style. And I just I just wanted to point out that those are, are two different things. The mission revival, which is really early, maybe 1890s through 1910 or so, and then the Spanish colonial style, which revival style, which is more like the turn of the century and onward. And this is one of the big turning points in, in, in this kind of movement was uh, the building by Bertram Goodhue of the Panama California Exposition in San Diego. San, San Diego is kind of jockeying for position among the big cities in California, and they hold a rival fair to the fair that was going on in San Francisco. Um, and for the architecture of that fair, they choose this melange of styles that really evoked different moments in Spanish history, but especially the ultra Baroque uh, Spanish architecture of the uh, Churigoresco style which is you know, really kind of early, early style, but add on to it images from throughout Latin America and other places. And it was largely in this particular building, um, the dome is based on a church in Mexico, in Tosco, Mexico. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we go on in our conversation, but the style like then, you know, <laughs> takes on all new uh, dimensions with uh, the mission Inn that was built in Riverside just to the east of LA. Um, beginning in 1902, um, Frank Miller, who owned this hotel, um, began to expand upon it and over decades just built and built and built upon this structure. I've actually, because of the pandemic, I haven't had a chance to go to this place in person, but it's one of the first, my first stops that I absolutely have to see. But it, I, again, like evokes all these different moments, Gothic, yeah. Renaissance, later architecture, some uh, architecture from Mexico and Latin America and just, you know, on a, an incredibly grand scale. Yeah. Um, but then the more appropriate style um, for mission in particular is, is 
kind of what, what we're looking at here. This is a particularly late iteration of the style in the 1920s. This is built in San Gabriel, which is really close to the San Gabriel mission. This is a civic auditorium um, there. But if you take off the front of this building and just look at the tall facade, that's probably pretty close to um, some of the mission architecture, bell towers, small windows, stucco facade. Um, and this, is, this becomes like a, the prevalent style in Southern California for various reasons that we'll discuss a little bit later. And then finally, um, perhaps a little bit better known is the Pasadena City Hall, just you know, five, 10 minutes north of here. Um, also from the late 1920s, that is kind of a mixture of the Spanish colonial style with a more Mediterranean focus and then kind of mixed with, with Beaux-Arts. So it, the, Span the mission style and the Spanish colonial style, revival styles, take on all these different aspects, um, but they become in many ways the identity of California architecture from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. Yeah, it's my, my there's something about California mission style or Spanish style that has led to some levity. Uh, Lydia observed that uh, one looked like a Taco Bell on steroids when you were talking about the Alamo on steroids. My daughter observed that they're all a lot nicer than the sugar cube mission she had to build. Um, but there is, you know, there's something absolutely defining about, uh, about these styles of architecture and the landscape in California. Absolutely. Um, I wonder, um, Elizabeth, if you, because I, there, there is this kind of intersection between the kinds of things you look at and the things that Dennis is looking at. So when you speak of the Moorish revival, I mean, I, when I was studying, uh, when I was in grad school, it was very often referred to as the Moorish craze. But when you sort of look at that, what, 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 do you, what do you mean by a Moorish revival? What does that mean? Yeah, so I, I want to pick up on um, a, a point that Dennis made about sort of a revival is sort of bringing something back from the ruins, you know. Um, and I think it's interesting to even coin the term Moorish revival because it is looking at a particular moment in um, sort of Islamic rule and history and especially the, the history of sort of Spain and North Africa. I'm looking to this sort of splendor that is in a state of decline after 1492. Um, and so when I think of the revival, I am specifically thinking of sort of an appropriation of, of architectural and design elements for from a specific source or a pastiche of sources that then take on new meanings in their new context. Mm -hmm. And so I see that sort of happening in the classical revival where, you know, Greco-Roman architecture is coming into America to sort of shape the identity of a new republic. Um, and I think something similar is happening with um, the Moorish revival where these sites of um, Islamic architecture that are primarily used for sacred spaces and places of worship are then adopted um, into the American landscape, but to sort of express ideas of um, leisure and grandeur, exoticism, and just sort of fancy. Um, so there are a couple of, of things I'd like to share. Um, so one thing I'll note is that um, we're seeing it being used for places of worship, but also for secular spaces as well. Um, so two of the um, two of the images that you see on the screen here are actually Shriners temples, um, one from the sort of 1920s and one from the late 19th century. And so here we see this mix of both Moorish elements with just general um, Islamic architectural elements. So for example, the Turkish domes at the top, um, the keyhole arches are, are here as well. But in the, um, in the image on the left, we see this ablock pattern, which is basically this alternating light and dark stone um, that we can see in the Tripoli Shrine Center that is sort of uniquely Moorish. And so there's this interesting thing that happens in the Moorish revival where um, there are sort of site specific sources that are coming about from Spain and North Africa and Portugal um, pre-1492 that is distinctly tied to sort of the Moorish Caliphate and, and the architecture produced during that time. Um, but then it sort of broadens out to representing Islamic architecture um, as a whole. So Indo-Islamic sources, um, things from Central Asia get lumped into that as well. And so it's this 
it turns into this larger catch-all term in a lot of ways. Um, so that's that's kind of what I think of when I mm -hmm. when I think of the revival itself. Great, thank you. And um, Lydia, um, you you're down south looking at. Um, I, mean, I think you've called it plantation revival. I mean, is that inaccurate? So what, I mean, what do you mean when you say revival? Because that, um, although the missions are bogged down with a lot of baggage as well, I mean, Lord knows plantations are. So what, when you're saying this, what do you mean by a revival? Sure. So I, um, I came at this project, my new project, which is a, um, a joint project and I'm actually in Alabama. I'm not literally standing in front of this building, but it's just up the street from where I am right now. This is a sorority house at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Um, but I'm working on this project with my research partner, Philip Mills Harrington, who's an architectural historian and, an, and a historian of 19th century plantations. So he, he keeps me honest on the real thing. Uh, and, then, and, then, uh, and then we come together to look at what we're calling plantation revival buildings together. But I, I started this project and, and Philip has been my collaborator and, and we've been really good friends and thinking about this for a long time by looking at Mount Vernon uh, and how it manifests in the colonial revival. And in my definition of the colonial revival, absolutely, it's of something that's not there anymore. <laughs> um, but it's also something that's also everywhere uh, the colonial revival I see as over the course of the first half of the 20th century, uh, and certainly with Mount Vernon beginning with its preservation in the mid 19th century, it becomes the colonial becomes the American default. It becomes the American default style for architecture for uh, of all scales, and it also becomes the American default style for for furniture. Uh, and so, I talk about um, Mount Vernon as a as a particular example of the colonial revival. It is scalable. You can stick a Mount Vernon porch on pretty much anything. And the mix here, we have funeral homes, motels, private homes, <laughs> um, airports, anything you want, dining halls. Uh, and so the colonial revival is really flexible and people don't need much <laughs> to recognize something as colonial. And they, they really don't need much to recognize something as Mount Vernon in particular. But one of the things that I started thinking about and that Philip and I started talking about over the past couple of years was how the kind of southernness of the colonial manifests differently than what we were seeing in, in the uh, colonial revival nationally. And that's where our project is now. Uh, and thinking about in the same period that Dennis and Elizabeth are talking about uh, from the really pretty surprisingly soon after the Civil War um, through to the present, uh, Americans are particularly interested in Southern architecture. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying Southern colonial architectures because this is very much antebellum architecture. Uh, and so I'm, I'm using the colonial revival term really flexibly in terms of the, the period, historical period I'm talking about. But whereas the, the colonial revival goes in from the late 19th century being something that's really specific uh, and often you're seeing replicated buildings or um, restored buildings that are associated with particularly his particular historic figures. Um, over time, it increasingly becomes focused on the aesthetic of the colonial, as especially as you have people like Miss Kimball and the founding of the American Wing, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the restoration of buildings like uh, Monticello. Uh, you have a kind of canon building of specific colonial buildings. That happens in a much looser way with Southern antebellum architecture. Uh, and for the most part, people think Southern historical architecture and they think of big columns. And that's really all you need um, to sell uh, the South in a, uh, in, a, in a revival context. And so the, what we're calling the plantation revival in some ways is a lot sloppier um, and is a lot easier to achieve than the colonial revival, which over the course of the 20th century, as we've heard in some of the other conversations in this series, people become much more specific about. Uh, they want, uh, they want they, they're able to differentiate between a Chippendale chair and a Sheraton chair. Uh, they're able to spot the, the spacing of, a, uh, of the, the bays in a Westover versus a Wick House. Um, and so you have the specificity that you really don't have um, in the replication or kind of appropriation of Southern architecture. And so our project is 
asking why. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why is why are Americans so much kind of so much more comfortable being squishy um, with Southern American architecture? And right now we're in uh, Alabama looking at the monster fraternity and sorority houses. These are all fraternity houses that have been built in the last seven years here at the University of Alabama. And none of these are really replicas of a particular building. The middle one gets pretty Mount Vernon-y, but you recognize them as Southern. Uh, and part of that is their context, right? They're at the University of Alabama. Um, they're they're in, a, in a landscape that once had real plantations, uh, but here they've been scaled up and they're in a completely different context. And so our project is trying to understand why this continues to be a really attractive style for architecture. I think in, in the case of, of Alabama, it kind of feels like the default, but how did we get there? Uh, and how does the establishment of a canon um, in Southern American architecture and, and its revival different than the establishment and kind of proliferation of a canon in colonial revival architecture? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, you know, in, in, in looking at all of your, um, it, the, the slides are really wonderful. I mean, there was some question about, you know, before we started, oh, well, I need slides, but I think they, they all of your slides do this really wonderful work. Um, and, and what they do for me in many ways is they remind me that, you know, that, that this is, buildings are, in, are always about people in the long run, right? And these, people use these things, they live in them, they work in them. And, and so they choose to be part of this. So my question, uh, let's start with Elizabeth, but it's for all of you again is, um, why do you think people gravitated towards this? Um, I, I gravitate towards my own old, old buildings. Since I've been in New England, I've become a huge fan of, of mill buildings. Um, there's something about the scale and the, you know, but why, why are people gravitating towards these moments through architecture, right? So Elizabeth, why don't you start us off this time? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, what I'll, I'll share my two case studies with you all and they are very awe-inspiring, very overwhelming to look at. Um, so the first, the first case study that I looked at in my, my thesis was Plum Street Temple in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and so what we really see is this sort of interior explosion of um, Moorish inspired architecture that's primarily looking to the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. Um, and one, you know, one reason I think that they are looking to the Alhambra is sort of on a case by case basis. I think um, with, with the Moorish revival, it's important to think about the sort of the, the reasons behind each person's intentions. And so in, in Plum Street Temple's case, they're really looking to um, this sort of golden era for, for Judaism pre-1492. Um, and I think that they are sort of seeking a, a connection, trying to establish some type of connection with um, Sephardic Judaism and its sort of heyday, if you will, um, pre-1492 before um, Catholic Spain comes into dominance in the region. And so that has sort of been what I've sort of uncovered um, through the, the writings of Isaac Mayer Wise, who is the, the reformed Jewish um, rabbi who is sort of leading the congregation at KK Benai Yeshurun. Um, and so I think that is sort of his uh, rationale behind wanting to adopt Moorish revival architecture in this space. But that's a very different story than you know what is going on with the William Sauntry Recreation Hall, which is also in the Midwest. It's in Minnesota, built in 1902. But the the reason that I think is primarily behind this, and in a lot of cases, um, is sort of this fascination with Orientalism during the 19th century. Right. Um, you know, people Orientalism is circulating across Western Europe. It's happening in. American art and American artists are, you know, depicting this foreign East, if you will, um, which included the cultures and regions of the Middle East and his historic Islamic rule. And so I think, you know, we see Orientalism in the, the art of this period, um, people looking back to the Alhambra and, and Moorish Spain as a site for uh, 
recollection and a site of glory pre-Catholic Spain again. Um, but I think it's also those sentiments of um, the fantastical and the association with the exotic for Orientalist taste, the sort of feeding into the, the frenzy, if you will, for um, replicating Moorish revival architecture throughout these spaces. Um, and one thing I'd like to note is that I really see the Moorish revival as sort of an interior focus um, in the early period of the 19th century when it first comes into play. Um, but it's after, you know, the 20th century where we really start to see more overt expressions on the exterior as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the field of Jewish studies at the time even, right, the, there's this look at, the, at, at Muslim Spain as, the, as right. the golden age of Judaism, yeah, and then Wise clearly is playing, is playing into that. Now, um, so Lydia, um, wh why, I mean, I think I have answers in my head, but you would know better than I. Why is it that whether it's the University of Alabama or Roswell, Georgia, or frankly, Scarsdale, New York, like why are people living in these imitation plantations? What, what is the reason they gravitate towards these things? You're muted. Thank you. Um, well, like Elizabeth, I, I, Philip and I really try to put our assumptions aside um, of why we think, when we approach a case study, why we think uh, people chose the, the um, plantation revival, uh, because it is really case by case. So at the University of Alabama, on the one hand, it seems really obvious. They have to build giant houses that house, you know, 50 50 young men or 50 young women. Um, these are wealthy students. Uh, and what else are they going to build? Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of it's kind of hard to imagine anything else. But when we look at the history of these buildings, it becomes a little bit, I think, more interesting and more complicated um, because the the giant plantation revival houses, like the one behind me, are actually the second generation uh, here at the Uni at University of Alabama. The first generation happens in the 50s and 60s. And these buildings, unlike Elizabeth's buildings, which start out as really interior focused, these plantation revival buildings are all about the exterior. The interiors basically, they're totally trash. They don't matter. Um, but it's they're stages. They're stages for the performance of, uh, of a kind of version of Southern gentility. And more specifically, this is you know playing Scarlett O'Hara at the, the Kappa Alpha house for Old South Week. It was a a big deal every every year. Um, but if you look at the racial politics of the period, uh, the 1950s and 60s, when the University of Alabama is building these buildings, they are very actively pushing back against the federal government's mandate yeah. to desegregate. Uh, and the conversations that are happening amongst the students, amongst the brothers who decorated this house with a giant Confederate flag, um, amongst the board of trustees, I was just reading the board of trustees minutes this morning, uh, they are they are pushing back against the federal government at the same time that they're taking the federal government's money, millions and millions of dollars of it, to build plantation houses um, that they know uh, that black people won't be able to live in. And in fact, the first uh, the first integrations don't happen until fifty years after these buildings are built. Uh, so there's this really interesting conversation that's happening that's much bigger than nostalgia for a kind of version of the Old South myth that comes out of Gone with the Wind. Um, it is very active in the politics of the moment, uh, in the political memory of reconstruction and the supposed oppression that, that white people in the 1950s in Alabama and across the South still felt uh, from that experience. So it, it starts to get a lot more complicated than, than we first assumed. On a really different example, we have Stone Mountain, Georgia, um, which is the biggest, literally the biggest Confederate monument in the world. Uh, and at the foot of Stone Mountain, so you can see it kind of down here where these big parking lots are, uh, is a plantation village that was assembled in the 1960s. Buildings brought from all over Georgia uh, and filled with antiques. Uh, and on the one hand, this kind of play plantation, this plantation that never existed, this kind of plantation theme park 
seems as if, oh, well, this is just the support for the monument. This is the damsel in distress um, that the giant figures of Lee and Jackson and Davis are coming to rescue, right? This is just supporting the lost cause. And it's that. But when Philip and I investigated the records of, of the individuals who put this together, this was much more about the study of Southern architecture, the study of Southern furniture, and a group of individuals, a socialite, an architect, and a decorator that were very much looking to promote themselves. They were assuming that their audience was going to bring with them all the assumptions about, um, about race, about kind of relationships between white people and black people in the antebellum period. They were assuming that guests would bring all that with them. They didn't interpret this at all. They put these buildings together. This was their dollhouse. Um, so they're swimming in the kind of pool of white supremacy. They're depending on white supremacy in order to gain an audience for this and in order for people to come and see this and have meaning. But this does not have the same overt political objectives that we are seeing playing out at the University of Alabama in the exact same period. Mm. So to echo Elizabeth's point, you can make these grand statements about what motivates people uh, to pick up on these styles, but until you really do the investigation of the individual case studies, you get it all no. Uh, mm. and, and it's convenient, it often the, the, the result it feels convenient, the result feels obvious, but the reasons historically might not be. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Dennis, I mean, thought, I, you know, thoughts about, I, I guess in some sense, Dennis, you've introduced two styles tonight, right? The Spanish colonial revival, mission revival. Are they, you know, are, well, why are people gravitating towards those? Are they gravitating towards different, these two different styles in different ways? What's, what's going on there with the people who are consuming these things? That's a great question. In the period that I've been looking at, you know, people in California are looking for a distinctive style that that would come to represent this place that was very different than the Midwest or the Northeast right. or the South. So they were kind of searching for something um, and they landed on at the beginning, the mission revival style um, and then eventually the Spanish colonial style. They all had kind of vague associations with aristocratic Spain um, to go back to the one building that I showed before, which is one of the kind of monuments of the Spanish colonial revival from 1915. Um, the architect uh, described it as what the poor Franciscan friars would have built had they had the money to reproduce what they, you know, all these incredible buildings, both in Mexico and in Spain. But in the language around this building and other buildings like it, they really deny the specific links to Mexico. It really becomes more associated with Spain, just you know Liz, what Elizabeth's talking about, uh, in particular, um, this kind of, you know, looking back at the kind of grandeur of the Spanish Empire um, at its height. And while I mentioned earlier that this building has uh, specific references to grand churches and other buildings in Mexico, that kind of history was, was really pushed to the side. And what we're seeing kind of to Lydia's point as well in California is the, uh, these buildings really representing the Anglo ascendancy in this time period. Um, they really deny links to Mexico, Mexican history. This is right after the Mexican revolution. So it's a really very touchy subject in, in California. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really trying to appeal to a lot of Midwesterners who are moving to California in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, my mind immediately went to the neighborhood that's around the Huntington, the neighborhood I live in, San Marino, which is a pretty Tony um, part of Los Angeles. Um, and in it, there's all kinds of styles, but it's, it's, there's a lot of Spanish colonial houses uh, in this neighborhood, but every other style you can possibly imagine. Midwestern ranch houses, um, colonial revival houses from New England, like salt box houses, English Tudor houses. I live in like a little English cottage house. Um, and I, on my way over here uh, to the Huntington, I actually took a picture of two houses oh, wow. that literally are like <laughs> practically side by side. You know, a really high-end Spanish colonial house. I know that was built in 1929. And then 
Lydia, you'd have to help me with what this is precisely, but um, and the fact that all these styles can exist simultaneously. Yes, of course, the Spanish colonial style is very suitable to the California climate and the kind of indoor outdoor living that was promoted um, in this time period when so many people were moving to the state. Um, but anyway, but but the fact that you see so many other Anglo buildings specifically referencing, you know, English history and English Tudor style um, that is, you know, perfectly in alignment with what Henry Huntington was collecting and creating here, which is, you know, one of the great collections of not only British portraiture, but also Anglo history uh, and literature. It's so interesting that you show that one of my first mentors is uh, in Cal State University in Northridge is a woman named Mary Avnik. I don't know if you've come across her yet, but Mary wrote this book called, uh, I think, The Other Side of the Rainbow, in which she, you know, the thing about California is people in Southern California in particular is this sense of reinvention, right? This idea that I can, I can build Spanish colonial, right? There, I can build a Cape Cod house. I can, you know, whatever you want, you can build in Southern California and, 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 um, and in some sense reinvent yourself. And, I can't help but reflect on the fact that I'm on Bellevue Avenue, where we have Italian palazzi. Uh, I'm in an English manor house right now as we speak, an enormous English manor house, but an English manor house nonetheless. And there's this connection, right, that, that seems very similar to what they're doing in Southern California in the 20th century. Um, now, Dennis, you mentioned um, climactic things, right? I mean, that's one of the things about architecture, certainly about homes, especially is building for the climate. And so I'm wondering from all of you, and we'll start, I think maybe this time with Lydia, um, is there something about the climate that lends itself to the Mount Vernonization of, of whole swaths of Alabama? Um, or, or is this about other things? It's not, and, and Dennis just proved my point. <laughs> um, <laughs> That, that that house looks like, I don't know, 70s, I want to say. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily, that building is necessarily plantation revival. I mean, that's where it gets kind of, maybe that one's just colonial revival. Uh, you need that context. I will say though, when uh, we, Philip and I examined the records of uh, David O'Selznick uh, at the University of Texas at Austin and actually looked at the file that the um, the folks who are making the decisions on what Terra and Gone with the Wind would look like, 90% of that file was pictures of houses from your neighborhood. Um, and so, so Terra actually had a lot more to do with, uh, with colonial revival and kind of plantation revival architecture being built in Los Angeles in the 1920s and 30s than it did with actual Southern architecture. And Margaret Mitchell noted. Um, but no, I don't think so. It, 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 with, the, with the Southern, um, the kind of version of the colonial revival, it's just a big porch slapped onto a box a lot of times, just mm. like the example that you just showed us, Dennis. So if I saw that same house in Tuscaloosa as I'm driving to dinner tonight, um, I would say, okay, plantation revival. Uh, and so it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with a specific period, a specific place in the South. Um, and, and that's one of the things I found really interesting about it because plantation architecture was incredibly connected um, to the landscape. And it was very rarely thought of as, as a single building as well. You had all these other buildings uh, that supported uh, the, the many people that it took uh, to run a plantation, the many enslaved people and also the other white people on the plantation. And all of that is stripped away. And right. you just get these columns to create this stage for the performance of the myth. And so climate really doesn't have anything to do with it. And I've been in plantation revival buildings that do a really good job replicating the facade of say a Louisiana um, River Road plantation house. But when you get inside, you're in Westover as far as the plan uh, and the arrangement of rooms, there's no consideration about the interior, exterior kind of fluidity of air or light that you would have in, in, on, on the Mississippi River in Louisiana. So it's really, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. so, and, and the materials don't really matter either. And that's part of it, which I would think would be different for say uh, the, the Dennis's examples. Um, right. 
you, you see stuff replicated in all different kinds of materials. They have no problem swapping stuff out. Uh, and so the answer is no. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, and so Lydia has pointed to the to materials and the way they function in Southern California, Dennis. I mean, do, do you think there is a, a, a climactic connection to mission and Spanish colonial revival styles, specifically in Southern California, and let's say specifically in California for the 1950s when air conditioning becomes widespread. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the what's great about those kind of buildings is that they keep cool in the summer um, and they promote this kind of idea of indoor outdoor living during all seasons of the year, which you can do in Southern California quite easily, even before air conditioning. And, um, you know, with those very thick walls and pretty small windows, um, they, uh, they work quite well climactically. Um, right. And of course, you know, this part of the world was Mexico not that long ago. Uh, and so that, you know, the architecture of central Mexico just makes it, finds its way up to Alta California. Um, and although for houses, the mission style wasn't terribly popular um, in many ways because small windows, small interior spaces, they don't, they weren't as grand and kind of light filled um, spaces that people were looking for in this time period. So you see a little bit later, you know, the, the growth of modern houses in LA in particular that really take advantage of the sunlight and the kind of the, the ability to like open up an entire wall of your house and just kind of go fluidly inside and, and outside. Right. So I think they had a, a fairly limited um, popularity for domestic architecture. Although in neighborhood I was describing here, which is a 1920s neighborhood, they're all over the place. Um, it's just that it doesn't it doesn't persist. And I think part of the the popularity of the Spanish colonial style is that it opens up other um, architectural features that were, you know, more suitable to the way that lifestyles change through the course of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth, I, I, you know, your what you've been showing us took place all over the country, right? So from, you know, you know, I, I once I think I once told you when we first maybe when we first talked that if at one time if you were building a reform or conservative synagogue in america of any note you built it in the Moorish style so it was everywhere um this is, so i'm i'm guessing that there's no geographic connection between the style and the land but but let me ask you about that do you have you found yeah any connection you know it's a it's a it's an interesting question i've certainly been in a couple of places villa catherine um which is in sort of southwestern Illinois, right on the Mississippi, overlooking a bluff. Um, and it has an interior courtyard, which is very cool. And I visited in um, the height of, of June, so it was very balmy outside. Um, and I was very shocked um, at, at how cool it was in the, in the interior. And so, you know, I think that is an interesting choice, but I don't know that that definitely played a a role in why Moorish Revival was, was used. As you pointed out, Eric, um, Moorish Revival sort of popped up all over the place. Um, and I think it was more so about the, the associations that people made towards the Moorish Revival more than sort of using it for a practical reason. I think if there were um, some some ideas around its climactic connections, I think we would have seen it a little bit more prevalent in the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just isn't, it pops up across the, the United States, but it's not as popular or as pervasive as you know, classical architecture might be or mission revival to California. Right. Um, so I think there's, there are other things at play with, um, with the use of more revival architecture. Terrific. Now I'm going to ask a question that Dennis will, will come to you towards the end because it, it, you may feel left out in this question because it's very specifically about, um, you know, the, the, the difference between what Lydia is telling us about um, the externality of, of the, this plantation revival, for lack of a better term, versus the, the internality about what, of, of what Elizabeth tells us takes place in the early phases. Um, honestly, I just, I, I will start with Lydia, but any thoughts on why? Um, what, why, let, let's limit it to sort of your field, right? What, why, 
why did only the porch matter or only the portico matter um, in, in these buildings? Well, this is a definitely like a key question that we're we're trying to right. answer with our yeah. different case studies right now. Um, and I've learned a lot about furniture in the process and how little Americans, even really, really people who were very embedded in the antiques market or the study of decorative arts knew about Southern made furniture um, until very pretty recently in the past, mm. and really in the past 40 years. And one of the things that we're seeing with the the real height of the plantation revival in the 1960s um, is that people are building, in some cases, like at Stone Mountain, very what they see as accurate restorations or replications or kind of montages of, uh, of in some cases, vernacular uh, antebellum architecture, but then they don't know what to put in it because there, there's really there's really very little knowledge and at that point, very little market for Southern made furniture. And if you go to Natchez and you see the really, the really fabulous um, interiors that have survived intact with their furniture, all that furniture is from New York anyway. <laughs> um, so, so it's in, especially in the Greek revival period. Um, and so often these interiors are just kind of throwaway colonial revival interiors, even when they have really good antiques, they're choosing Chippendale antiques to put in a, uh, a in a in a building that on the outside evokes, you know, the 1830s River Road, um, and there's no discussion of there being a conflict there. I think our 21st century scholarly approach sees a conflict, but there was no conflict at the at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and for the most part, the people that we're looking at, we're not trying to create museum level restorations, and so that that wasn't or reconstructions, and that so that wasn't a concern. Uh, but going back to this performance aspect, um, it really it really is a, an outward statement that, uh, for the most part, people wanted people who use this architecture want others, their audience, to see and make assumptions about immediately. It's not mm. something they want people to have to think deeply about. I think the building behind me speaks to wealth. I think it speaks to whiteness. It speaks to uh, a kind of connection to a version of the South, even though I, I, I'm sure at least half of, of the young women who live in this building and other buildings like it are from, you know, Ohio, Illinois, and, and California. Um, and so that, that need for the uh, for the the client to sell an idea really fast that that's really where the architecture begins and ends mm. and so the interior you don't need to go into the interior uh, of these buildings in order to get it and uh, and so that that efficiency is really achieved by the size and the color of the columns yeah I, that wow, that's really interesting. Um, well, I can't wait to read what this looks like when you guys are done with it. Um, Me too. So, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, um, Elizabeth, you, you talk about this sort of opposite thing happening, right? This focus on interior. Um, why do you think that is? I mean, if, if Lydia tells us, right, there's this, you, you need to sort of communicate things like that. Um, there's something very different happening with the Moorish craze in some sense. So why do you think that is? Yeah, so I think one of the reasons why the Moorish revival was so popular was because it was about, you know, heightening the expression of, of Moorish splendor in a space. And it's hard to really evoke that, that overwhelming sense through an exterior only. Um, and I think a lot of that has to be experienced in an immersive environment. Um, and so often in a lot of these places, there were decorative arts that were either Moorish or Islamic inspired um, that decorated the space. Um, so I'll just show you for an example, um, what you're seeing on the screen right now is the exterior of both um, William Sauntry Hall and Plum Street Temple on the right, and then the interiors of each space. And so you can see that both coincidentally black and white photographs are very sort of subdued on, on their exterior. I mean, Plum Street Temple sort of evokes more of a Gothic um, revival going on with two minarets, but that's sort of the only expression of, of Moorish and Moorish design that you really get. 
mm. for William Sauntery Hall on the left, you can't really see what yep. you're going to encounter until you enter the space. And it's once you enter those spaces that you're overwhelmed with this sense of um, exoticism and sort of a fantastical experience. I mean, you know, Sauntery Hall was all about entertainment. They had progressive euchre tournaments. There was a bowling alley in it. Um, and even the, the current owners of it, or at least the owners while I was researching, decided to also furnish the place with um, uh, sort of pearl inlay and sort of octagonal um, footrests and really just trying to heighten the, the sense that you get from the space itself. And so I think, you know, I, I chose these case studies because I was seeing that there was a lot more about um, the interiority of the space and the immersive experience that comes from that, especially during the late 19th century. What I find really interesting though, is that around the turn of the 20th century and into the teens and 20s, you're getting an explosion on the exterior and the interior. <laughs> And so we have the Regal Avalon in Chicago built in 1928 that is sort of giving you, it's giving you a lot of Alhambra-esque architecture. It's, it's providing a little Turkish dome and a couple minarets. And that, that explosion is reiterated in more of a, a whimsical sense in the exterior or in the interior as well. So it's hard to tell, you know, where you have now traveled once you've entered this space, but you know it's something inherently foreign and exotic. Um, and I think it's just an interesting progression that we see in more revival architecture um, across the sort of late 19th into the 20th century. Mm. Stunning. Um, Dennis, I wonder, you know, from my own experience with the, you know, with going into homes that look like Mission Revival, there is a kind of furniture that was built to look appropriate in there. And so I wonder, um, are you seeing either of the things that Elizabeth or Lydia is talking about in Spanish and colonial uh, or Mich Spanish and mission colonial, or is there a kind of melding or what, what, do, what do you see going on in terms of interior and exterior? Yeah, actually, I see elements of both what Lydia and Elizabeth are talking about. Um, the style um, coincided with the growth of the arts and crafts movement, for example, the development of craftsman furniture and you know, think of Stickley, think of right. Frank Lloyd Wright later on. Um, even at the earliest iterations of the style in a domestic sense, um, thinking about there was an architect, uh, Charles Fletcher Loomis, yeah. who was not only um, promoting the style with new buildings, but also restoring the old mission buildings. And he was responsible for some of the the largest restoration projects of the Franciscan missions in California. But the interior of his house which is this very unusual mission revival style is, you know, filled with furnishings. Um, Are you talking about El Ali Sal? Exactly. It's exactly okay. Yeah, yeah. Style, which I think refers to a sycamore tree. Right. The word, but you know, it's it's filled with pueblo furniture. So that you know, really, you think that's more New Mexico and you know right. pueblos, and so there's it just everything kind of blends together, and the the kind of the buildings themselves create a blank canvas. Yeah in which many interior furnishings look very good, quite frankly. And some, some authors have even described, you know, talked about green and green as having elements of these styles, even though that they're much more um, Japanesque in their, you know, in the details of the ornamentation, but just, you know, it's all kind of happening at the same time. Um, so I, I, don't, I think it's interesting. And, you know, thinking about exteriority, uh, to go to Lydia's point, the, the first architect that came to mind is, is one of my, one of my favorites, who is um, another kind of transplant architect, but Irving Gill, who is a really strong modernist architect and was very inspired by European modernism. And he built a lot of domestic buildings after the turn of the 20th century. This is a complex um, in Sierra Madre in 1910. And he reduces the mission style to its like essence. What are those elements that will telegraph the, the key moments of the style, the key thoughts of the style. So the archways, the kind of small windows, the blockiness of the facades, the, you know, stucco, white stucco taking the place of adobe. Um, so I, I just love his, I love his buildings. And he, he gets, although he gets a lot of different commissions, 
he gets pushed aside for the big public commissions in favor of those really grand over the top Spanish and Latin American style buildings. Um, but I just, it's a fantastic, and, and, and when you go inside the buildings, uh, you know, Gill's houses, they're, they're look like European modernist houses kind of mixed with Mission Revival. So I just think he's able to distill the key elements of the style in such an interesting way. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's fine. We'll have to talk about Lummis at some other time together yeah. because, you know, he was, of course, the founder of the Southwest Museum, which um, merged with the Autry and I worked yeah, there for Yeah, exactly. Years. You have a lot of experience there. And, you yeah, know, he's a collector as well. So he traveled, he traveled through South America yes. and, you know, amassed huge collections and was and, interesting. And, right. And theor theoretically walked from Chillicothe, Ohio to Los Angeles <laughs> to take a job at the LA Times. But that's for another that's for another session. Um, I, I have one more question because we're at eight o'clock or actually we're past it. It's, it's been it's eight ten. I want to ask a quick question. And then actually we have a question from Carl Nold. But let me just quickly say, because this time of night, I start to see people disappear. Um, next week is the final session. We will be looking at um, how this work plays out in public history. Um, Ruth Taylor from Newport Historical Society will be here. Gina Tangora from Newport Restoration Foundation will be here. And Reginald Richard, who is a reenactor at Mount Vernon, um, will be where he reenacts an enslaved person, um, will be here talking about his experience as well. The last question is to ask you to stop being historians and become futurists. And what revivals do we see coming down the pike in the future? What architectural, furniture-based, cultural-based um, restorations of the past do we think we'll see? Why don't we, we'll start with Elizabeth. Any thoughts? Yes. <laughs> so um, I don't know if this is just a, a generational thing or me being surrounded by a lot of um, scholars of the 18th, 19th century, but you know, a, a lot of people I, I personally know are wanting to do away with modernism. Modernism has been around <laughs> for a very long time. And so I see um, a lot of, of people sort of in my generation or a little older sort of turning back to the Victorian era and looking at the architecture of that period and helping to revive that. But they're doing so with a, um, with a contemporary take. They're sort of mixing in their, you know, modern conveniences with the aesthetic of um, sort of the architecture of the Victorian era. And so I would, I would love to see what that looks like. I personally have a big interest in um, Art Nouveau and Art Deco architecture. And so I am waiting for the day where it is socially acceptable to revive that. Um, but I, I would love to see sort of a turn to um, some of, some of those architectural moments in, in history, because I think modernism has sort of carried us, modernism, postmodernism, and its many iterations are, are sort of still lingering. Um, and so I, I'd like to see a, a different revival come back into-, into Got it. There. And, there, and there's, by the way, your second book, you've out, outlined a number <laughs> of the chapters already. Um, <laughs> Dennis, what are your thoughts? What, what's the next? What should what revival should we all be investing in for 2030, perhaps? That's a good question. I I see climate change as having a big impact on architecture and the way people live. And, and I'm sensing maybe a return to architecture, you know, pre-air conditioning, as you said earlier, Eric, um, buildings that can function within their environments and allow people to live without some of these modern conveniences that um, are wonderful but wasteful. And so I just I just wonder I actually think the kind of this um, this more Mediterranean style of buildings actually could function quite well in in our changing world. Yeah, good point. And and Lydia, have any thoughts on this? Is interesting. I I'm here for the Victorian revival. Um, <laughs> I love that. That stuff is so cheap right now. I should totally get on it. I mean, we're in we're in the middle of such as as Elizabeth suggested, such a revival of mid century modernism. I mean, MCM is on every single thing, no matter when it was made that you try to buy on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist right now. People have no idea what it means, um, and 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 it's it's selling, and it and it's 
it, I mean, you can buy, you can buy pretty decent mid-century modern looking stuff at Target right now. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think we're in the middle of a huge revival that we're going to look back. I'm already looking back and hoping it goes away because um, it's making a lot of junk. Uh, but I, I think I, I like this idea of, I hope that people will think more deeply about historic floor plans uh, and, and think about the ways in which buildings historic buildings in the United States were designed to work with the landscape and work with, with air and light uh, and, and stop making stages and start, and start thinking more deeply about how we can, uh, we can live in a world that's changing really fast. Yeah. Great. Um, so, um, Caitlin, I see we've got some stuff going on in the chat. Do you want to help us sort of Think yeah. about this and ask these questions. Certainly. So, so we had um, a question earlier uh, from Carl Nold. Uh, Carl Nold, sorry, um, as Eric noted earlier. So, Carl's asking if anyone has looked at the influence of fraternal organizations on revivals. So, his examples are Shriners, Odd Fellows, Scottish Rite, and also patriotic groups like GAR, which I think is Grand Army of the Republic, is what GAR stands for. Um, so Carl is asking about fraternal organizational influence on revivals. Anyone have any comments on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say, um, and I'll, I'll share it again, just in case um, you all didn't catch it. But um, these two, the Tripoli Shrine Center and the Lulu Temple are two examples of Shriners temples that were created um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. And so we do see um, that Shriners are sort of taking on um, Moorish history and sort of adopting it to suit their, their needs. And so a lot of Shriners temples are actually created in this style as well. Um, I decided not to explore that because I think that is a, a research project in its, in its own. Um, and I had some concerns about whether I would be permitted to, to access some of those, those spaces. Um, just given some of the, the policies in place for Shriners as, as a fraternal organization. Um, but I, I do think that they are certainly one of the main groups that are sort of popularizing the style in the 19th century. And we do see um, that that plays a, a role in why it sort of appears in various places across the United States is because the Shriner um, temples are popping up across the, the US and with that comes the, the use of Moorish architecture too. Great, Dennis or Lydia, any thoughts on, on fraternal organizations and, nope. Well, I saw something else, Caitlin, did we have another? Yeah, so there's there's one last question. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, that uh, it, someone is interested in hearing if, if any of you are familiar with the architect Paul Revere Williams who I've sure. personally never heard of, <laughs> um, but I guess he used a lot of different styles. He designed for a lot of different people. He designed uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel. Um, so if any of you are familiar with him, have any comments on, on how he connects to some of, some of the things you're all talking about? Uh, Elizabeth shook her head no, so Dennis or Lydia? Yeah, good question. And Eric, you might help with this question too, since you're from California, but Paul Williams is a, you know, and a really, really important early modernist architect um, had a huge hand in shaping um, the modern city of Los Angeles today. And yeah, an African-American architect um, with a, a very diverse and interesting client base. Um, and he worked for both, the, you know, I know for, for major house commissions, but also uh, public commissions, but as well, I think Beverly Hills Hilton was mentioned and many other, you know, buildings that have, that have become so iconic for, for the city. Yeah, I mean, he's, when you, you know, I'm not an architectural historian by any stretch of the imagination, um, but if you study California even a little, he comes up all the time. And I also think, he, and I could be wrong, but I think he was involved, there are a number of really interesting modernist, almost sort of like planned communities post-World War II, before the suburbs become sing, you know, definitively single homes. Right, there are these garden apartment programs that are built to sort of on shared communal spaces. I think he did a, a, at least a few of them down La Cienega because um, it was a very well-known sort of upper middle-class African-American enclave um, 
further south as you head towards the airport. But um, so, um, yeah, that's, but he comes up all the time in, in, in California history. He's uh, an extraordinary architect and, and, a, and a pioneer, of course, because the, as I think Gail pointed out, the first African-American to join AIA and uh, really amazing. Um, so we have no more questions, which is good because it's getting late, not for you, Dennis, but for the rest of us who've been out and about all day doing our work. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of you tonight. Um, I learned so much every time I talk to you guys. So, so let's just keep meeting every Wednesday night and we'll just, I'll learn more from you. Um, but since we probably can't do that, please join us next week when, um, as I said, we'll be thinking about how public history sites engage in um, studying the colonial past. And um, one of the people in preparation for that discussion is actually recommended we think about it as beyond revival, right? If what we've been looking at is how people revive the past, uh, are we in the business of critically assessing the past? Um, and I think in Mount Vernon, it's gonna be a very interesting question. Are we critically assessing as we revive, right? It's really, really interesting, but again, Thank you so much. Thank you to Lydia Brandt. Thank you to Dennis Carr. Thank you to Elizabeth Humphrey. Thank you to Caitlin Seller, who, as always, is my partner in crime in these endeavors. Um, we will see you next week. And um, thanks to everybody. Have a good night. Bye.